What's going on, Warrior Soul Nation? This is Chris Albert, and welcome to another episode of the Warrior Soul Podcast. Today, I am very privileged to bring to you Antonio Centeno, and this is a fantastic uh, episode for us to be doing. Antonio has done so much work as far as getting people to learn more about something that's extremely important, and that's style, personal style, understanding how to wear clothes, understanding that the clothes make the man. And he's got 1.6 million followers on YouTube. So he's helping people around the world to increase their style. He's also teaching people about things like life skills and business and you name it, you can, you can find it on Antonio's channel. And one of the best things about Antonio is that he is a United States Marine Corps veteran. And uh, I got into his channel a few weeks ago because of uh, another guest we had, AJ Harbinger from The Art of Charm. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated with what I saw. So Antonio, I just want to welcome you to the podcast and thank you for coming on today. Hey, you're welcome, Chris. Proud to be here. So anything I can answer and help vets with, I'm ready to do. Definitely. I, I want to get into a little bit of your story because I, sure. I know you served as a United States Marine Corps officer. Um, yep. We were talking about uh, prior to, uh, to, to me hitting the record button, you know, you ser started serving in 1997, went up uh, into the 2000s and, you know, you had this really interesting path where you went from being a Marine Corps officer to today broadcasting on YouTube and talking about men's style. Uh, can you give us a little bit, uh, a little bit more about your story, a little bit more about how you got into this line of work? Well, I think that right there is just, it should give a lot of the guys out there hope because I'm sure, you know, all the sergeant, sergeant, you know, first, uh, you know, with staff sergeants, they're like, gosh, if this Marine Corps officer can actually do something, maybe <laughs> I've got some, I, it's going to be easy for me because, hey, you know, the, the guys that I saw that, that did have the most impact and still to this day, my staff sergeant, he was, you know, I was an, I was an 0180 and he was amazing because I came in as a second lieutenant with no idea and this guy had four kids and he was just making things happen and I was greatly inspired by you know my staff sergeant I remember my sergeant major who taught me how to go out there on the parade field and to make things happen for my corporals that you know very gently just showed me you know through what what is possible and uh, so you know for those guys I think if if, if I can go in and make a success of myself here, I think, you know, should give hope to everybody that it's possible because, uh, you know, one of the big things when you start off and you get into whatever you're going to you know do after the military is that you don't have to do what you did in the Marine Corps or the Air Force or whatever, you know, unit you're part of or what, what your MOS is that does not define you. And that took me a while to figure out because so many of us think that, okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a logo or, you know, maybe I'm an admin guy, I'm a grunt. So I've got, you know, okay, I'm really good with, with my weapons and stuff. So I need to go to FBI or I need to go into law enforcement. And I really think that that's the wrong mindset because what the Marine Corps gave me, what the Army gives, I think, you know, soldiers and, you know, in the Navy, you know, for sailors and the Air Force and the Coast Guard is it really gives us amazing leadership skills. And that, it, you've heard this probably before, but it is, it can't be understated because managing, leading, getting a team to do whatever you need it to do is something that you're going to use throughout your life and to be able to inspire, to be able to get up in front of a group of people and convince them that they need to invest in you, whether it be time, whether it be money, this is, this is a skill set that, that is just so key. So, yeah, I joined back in 1997, uh, just straight out of college. Uh, actually si signed up in 97, but didn't officially go active duty till 1998. Um, went through TBS. Actually, I was a, a blew out my sinuses in the T-34. Um, wow. So I started off as a, as a student naval aviator, went through Pensacola, went through Corpus Christi, but ended up going and becoming uh, an 0180, going right into, basically, it's an adjutant uh, in an infantry battalion. So I was what they call a combat adj, and I uh, didn't think too much of it. In fact, I was very disappointed, I have to admit, with that. I mean, you go from flying uh, you know, T-34s to all of a sudden you're stuck in a desk and you're doing admin work. And not only that, you're in an infantry battalion, so you got to go hump multiple times. And you have all these o O3s that are giving you, giving you a lot of crap, especially your fellow officers, uh, because you know they're off doing their sniper stuff or they're out training with their unit. And 
you're just back again doing paperwork, processing awards. I was just like, what? You know, I definitely am going to get out. Like, this is not for me. And that was going to be my path until I had, you know, great mentors that just came in, you know, from my, from my XO to, you know, just other officers that, that say, hey, this guy needs to get back on track to, you know, I had gunnery sergeants. Uh, you know, they, they, a lot of uh, actually and first sergeants that came in from, because I was reporting to them and they're like, you know, we got to get this guy on his track because if he's not, then it's really going to affect us. And it was them, it, it was those guys, I think, that really taught me what I need to know. And so I deployed with the 11th Mew back in 2002. And then as soon as we got back from that, it was, hey, like there's something going down in Iraq. Obviously, we talked about the 2001, everything that happened then and how the mindset shifted of we're no longer peacekeeping. We're going after, you know, we're going after the guys that, yeah. uh, that hurt us. And so in two, early 2003, we deployed um, with, at the time it was, uh, you know, reinforced uh, infantry, uh, basically was a BLT, uh, BLT. Um, and so we went out and that was with the 1st Marine Regiment. And I was with 3rd Battalion 1st Marines. And it was us, 1-1, one, one, and uh, some of those other guys. And we jumped on a boat, took a slow boat over and got ready. And we basically hit, I think it was in Feb late February, when we were in what was it, uh, Kuwait, and uh, then went up straight into Iraq uh, on the initial day. I think that was March, March something, Mar mid March. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember the exact date, but I do know that it was, you know, just an amazing experience. And this is what we trained up for. So we went through Nazaria, we went over to Al Kut, and then we went right into Baghdad. So to be a part of that, and I think what what I took from this, and the reason I kind of wanted to share with you guys a little bit of my story, is that uh, I know some of you guys are listening, maybe you never got to experience combat. Some of you guys probably got a little bit too much, much more than what you ever wanted. And uh, I, I do think though, and we are talking about the importance of timing and no matter how you served, you know, just remember that, you know, this, you, this contribution you made, you know, is something that I'm, I'm always grateful because I, I got out, you know, I, I think relatively easy. I'm, I got it, you know, bit of disability with my head because of uh, the sinus blowing out and I'd have surgery and stuff like that. But I mean, that's a small price to pay compared to a lot of guys that never came back and made the ultimate sacrifice. And I think as, as vets that come back, it's our job, especially those of us that are out to reach back and to really try to, to help those uh, veterans and, and those that are still in to open their minds to what is possible beyond the military. Because so many guys are getting out. And if you look at, you know, what is it? One out of 22 vets, you know, or one, one out of, uh, is, it, is it 20? I, there's some crazy number about right the now number the VA of suicides. Has it at, uh, 20, 20 veterans a day. So that, some, that was the yeah. last numbers the VA released. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, and I mean, think about that. That's crazy. It's, it's horrible. Why, why are we, you know, why are we killing ourselves? And I saw it when we got back from deployment. We had one of our staff sergeants hang himself. We had another guy, you know, shoot himself. I mean, it's just like, what is going on here? And I, I think, uh, you know, for us to be able to inspire and motivate and to help, because let's face it, the VA ain't going to do it. You know, the government is not going to help. Our, and, and to good measure, because I get it, the, the, Marine, the job of the Marine Corps is to fight and win wars. The job of the Army is to go in and just overwhelm and destroy the enemy. The job of the Chair Force, I mean, Air Force, we love it, <laughs> is, is to, you know, I had saw some guy with a quote the other day. He's like, you know, the Air Force doesn't figure out how to get rid of the enemy on top of the mountain. They just destroy the mountain. I'm like, glad you're on our side. But my job is to, I, I look at it now, is to inspire these vets and to show them what's possible. And if, a, you know, if, a, if, if an unmotivated, you know, first lieutenant, you know, who, you know, can go off and do amazing things on YouTube, then, it, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. Whether, you know, I saw, I've seen the Lance Corporal get out and, and start this amazing, I don't know if you follow, uh, you know, what, what uh, Max is doing over at uh, Terminal Lance. Yeah, Max. But, Matt, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, amazing. And just, you see this guy go out there and just create this, this whole thing. I, I mean, I, I remember we had a stat, he was, well, he was an E6 that was in the Air Force at the time. And I mean, he had built up this game on Amazon and he had created like a $2 million a year business that he was getting drop shipped and he was still active duty. And I mean, so, uh, so yeah, so one of my projects, I don't know if you know about this, it's called High Speed Low Drag. And this is where we've worked with veterans. Uh, we did a number of interviews. I worked with a guy named John Lee Dumas, who was a mm -hmm. uh, tank commander in Iraq as well. We were at about yep. the same time. And this guy's built a multi-million dollar business podcast. Entrepreneur on fire, yeah. Yep. yep. 
then you've got Tom Morcus. Um, and, and Tom is, he just went into the publishing world and he was a, you know, don't hold this against him, but he went to, uh, what was it, to West Point and, you know, Army, army officer there. But this guy, you know, he's redefined himself. He's over in Living the Dream in Colorado, and he's helping, uh, you know, people create content with the written word. And none of us, if you would have asked, like, John, did you go to school to become a podcaster? No, he didn't go to school. He, uh, I didn't go to school to become a YouTuber. I didn't even go to school to get into the fashion industry. But what I realized is I could take that hard work, that discipline, and that ability to say, you know what, I've been in some really tough situations and this doesn't even compare you know they can come take my house they can you know threaten you know to i don't know take away my car whatever like i got my life and you you know we don't have debtors prison in this country anymore so mm-hmm. hey i you know, i can do yeah i just you can't hurt me when you've got that i think type of mentality which i think a lot of vets have is uh, you can go off and do pretty amazing things yeah that's uh you know, there's so many lessons in what you just said. Number one, I can't believe that it's almost 15 years since since uh, 2003, which is absolutely crazy. I feel like I'm getting older and older. Uh, number two, you know, I think that um, uh, the lessons that you learned as far as uh, trying to get mentors, the lessons in humility, trying to find people who can support you and who can teach you and who can um, educate you on the path that you need to take and, and, and who could go to bat for you. I think that's, that's so important to learn and to understand. And, and that definitely takes a good degree of humility. And then, you know, finally, understanding those possibilities that are out there um, that you don't necessarily, you're qualified for a whole lot if you served in the infantry in the Marine Corps, especially if you, uh, you, you held a leadership position. And um, that's something, you know, I learned when I was going through some hard times, I was living out of my car a few years ago and somebody told me to start a YouTube channel and my YouTube channel is nowhere near the size of yours, but it still gave me a launch to my career as an online trainer. And so I've been able to deliver fitness advice to people around the world. And I think it's absolutely amazing what you've done and, and, and what you just said to everybody. One of the big questions I have is, at what point did you realize that YouTube was the route you needed to take, that, that you needed to leverage this awesome free technology that was being put out there to get your message out there? Um, and, and what kind of mistakes did you make along the way? You know, I, I think I made a lot of mistakes. And that's, that's the truth of the matter is that you got to view it. If you're, anyone's a baseball fan out there, they know, you know if you're batting 400, over your career, you're probably going to get into the Hall of Fame. That's an amazing batting average. But what that also indicates is that you're striking out six out of 10 times. And I think in life, what's great is you don't even have to, like you could be batting a 100 and you're going to be doing great. The thing is you got to keep going up to bat. You got to keep swinging. You got to try to learn from every time you're, you're up there and you're not always going to learn. Sometimes you're just going to swing and miss it, but you got to be able to move on. You got to be able to keep going. And I think Anyone that has dealt with adversity, anyone that is, ha, has gone through tough and trying times, anyone that has been pushed to the limit, you know, that, that's, that's what business is in many ways. And you just got to be consistent. You've got to consistently work to get better and realize, hey, be willing to go through the suck. I think the people that impressed me most when, it, when I would go through training, anyone that's been through like SEER school, anyone that's gone through, uh, you know, just long, you know, at, you know, infantry training for whether it be Marines or the army, uh, different types of flight school training. I know for the, for the air force or, you know, for the, it's one of those things, SEAL training. They, it's the people that can just obs- take the sock. They mm-hmm. are, in fact, it's the guys that are singing when things are bad at three o'clock in the morning and you're getting, you know, you're cold, you're freezing, you're getting sand thrown in your face and you just you start belting out fun songs because you realize, hey, like, I, I don't have, I'm not looking forward to next year. I'm looking for, if I can make it through the next minute, I'm fine. And if I can make it through the next, I can want to just make it the next 15 minutes, the next hour. And, you know, it's that type of mentality sometimes in business that's going to get you through those tough times. Um, for me with YouTube, you know, being able, I, I did not, I had no idea that I would go towards YouTube. When I started this journey in 2007, I, what I did have to deal with is giving te- somebody $10,000 to build a website for me and then basically failing me and keeping my money. I had to deal with you know, writing for years um, articles that I can't write to save my life, uh, but I can, I, I'm a horrible typer. But just going through this and creating hundreds of articles that 
you know, why did I do that? Because I, that was the only path I knew. I was like, well, if I created some content online, maybe someone would find it. And it did bring me quite a bit of traffic, but it wasn't what I really loved. And I, I can't even imagine having to still create all of that content. Uh, but what I did find eventually was it, you know, I don't mind creating a video. Like this is really easy for me. I can talk, I can get in front of that camera. I feel like I, I can try to motivate. I'm really good at moving my hands around. You know, at least that's what people told me on, you know, it's kind of a joke <laughs> uh, on my channel that my hands go everywhere. But at the end of the day, I had a message to share. And because I had written those hundreds of articles, actually I knew quite a bit about men's fashion. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, to share that information. And it just so turned out, you know, I was swinging and swinging and swinging. I got, that, I caught that ball, you know, just out of pure luck. And all of a sudden we started, I started realizing, wow, I'm pretty good at this type of swing. What if I did another one, did another one. And then, you know, you get a little bit hard headed too. And you're like, well, I'm going to try this a hundred times and I'm going to try this 200 times. And so we did you know, like 200 videos in 200 days, which may sound like a lot, but I batched those videos. I didn't edit them. I just simply threw them up. So it's like, you know, you don't have to have perfect form when you show up at the gym and you don't have to show up every, you know, every single day or even be there an hour every time you show up. But if you show up to the gym, you know, at least four to five times a week, I mean, just almost by osmosis, you be in there, you're going to start to pick up the right habits. You're going to start lifting those weights. You're going to start looking around saying, oh, that guy, you know, he's built pretty well and he's doing it that way. I'm going to follow him and do what he's doing or maybe ask him for advice. And that's exactly what happened on YouTube. I saw other people that were kicking butt, kind of imitated what they were doing. I simply tried to get better, but I kept showing up. I kept consistently putting that stuff out there. And, and then we started taking off, you know, and that's really, you know, it was kind of my philosophy. I knew I wanted to get to a million views. So I was like, well, if I did a million videos and I got one view each, that's going to get me there. But I didn't think that would happen. I felt that, you know, but I, I was willing to put in a thousand videos because I'm like, well, if I can get a thousand videos and each one gets a thousand views, there's my million, right? Yep. So, so that was, that was kind of my logic to it. Like just being willing to put in that type of effort and not being a lot of most people you're going to hear them. They complain. They're like, man, I did everything I could. I tried everything. Did you really? How many things do you try? Try twice. Try it. Maybe you maybe tried it once. You didn't try it a million times. Come on. And I think a lot of guys, you know, a lot of vets, you know, they're willing to try a hundred times. And if you're willing to try something a hundred times, you're, you're way ahead of the vast majority. Absolutely. You know, it, and, and it's funny because we live in these times where it seems like people come out of thin air and they become successes. You know, we, we see a lot of YouTube channels just that seem to just pop up. We see a who lot of yeah, businesses. But that, I'm like, who really comes out of thin air? Right, exactly. Every, uh, exactly. And, and I can't think is, of what, anyone. Like, yeah, what I'm saying is you don't, you don't know the complete story. You don't know how many videos that that person did that got no views or that got 100 views. You, know, you don't know. Yeah, Casey Neistat. Everyone's like, oh, where did he come from? It's like, man, this guy, this guy busted his butt for 25 years mm -hmm. in video. And he gets a break and people assume, oh, he came out of nowhere. It's like this guy has been working his butt off for 25 years. And we just see this blip when he has his, like, his moment. That's what we see. You know, even like someone more controversial, like, that, you know, this guy, Logan Paul, I don't know if you follow, like, they got huge followings. I mean, I think their content's kind of junk, but you know, one thing I do respect, they were wrestlers. And mm. in high school, him and his brother, like it, any wrestler I respect, because that's like one of those sports that, I mean, they start when they're like 10 years old and they're going without water. They're, they're working out, you know, start at 5 a.m. I mean, they've, they understand what work is and Everyone I see that apparently is an overnight success, there's like 10 years, there's 20 years of work prior to this. Right. And that's what people just like to ignore that. But no, no there's, always, there's always something there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see that all. I'm I'm good friends with uh, C T Fletcher, um, and I used to be his nutrition coach. He's a big fitness YouTuber, and uh, the people don't realize that you know four or five years ago the guy had nothing. He didn't have two dimes to scratch together, and and uh, it took a long time for him to get his name out there. It took a long time for him to uh, to be able to, but you know it. He, he took a chance and got the video up, and in that first video that that he had done for him did amazing. Um, but why style? Like, so, so when you were in the Marine Corps, were, were you thinking a lot about style at the time? Were you thinking a lot about fashion? Um, did you always have a passion for clothes? 
No, not at all. Uh, I came into, you know, the whole thing kind of as a mercenary. There's Andrew Warner talks about this. So you are either get into a business because you're a mercenary or you're a missionary. Missionaries are going after it because they've got a big, they, they don't care about the money. They just got a big mission. And the mercenaries are in it for the money. Like they see opportunity, let's go do it. I was a mercenary. Uh, what I saw is that got graduated from business school, went to UT, actually got it, got it paid for for free as a Hazel, Hazelwood Act allows any Texas vet to go to a public school uh, combat vet for free. So something if you've never heard of this, check it out. But uh, what uh, what I what I learned is that uh, it's a lot of you know it's not as easy as I thought because I had this tailor that I spoke with and he was making uh, like three hundred thousand a year. And he had worked for 25 years to be, build up this booklet. Uh, he was a traveling custom clothier. And I was like, man, like I've got this fancy degree. Like I like clothing. Like, it's interesting to me. Uh, and I like custom suits. So what, why don't I just jump into this and build up in, in just a couple of years what took him 25 years? That was my thought process. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't exactly work out that way. In fact, my first business, a tailored suit, speaking of failures, failed. I mean, I just couldn't get enough revenue and I couldn't get enough profitability and I wasn't going to go back and work and own the factory, which is, I think what you need in that industry to succeed. But what it did do, owning a tailored suit opened my eyes to the possibility of, wow, what I could do with content marketing and everything there. So again, it was fail, 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 fail. Oh, that thing worked. And I zeroed in there. But getting back to the question about fashion, I don't care about fashion, but what I care about is looking good. And mm -hmm. I don't know a Marine that didn't care about looking good. In fact, if you put on your ribbons incorrectly, what would happen? Somebody's going to chew your ass out. Somebody, somebody's going to chew you out. They're going to correct you. If yeah. you put your jump wings on sideways, do you think anyone's, yeah, every, I mean, you're going to get smacked. They're going to be like, you know, it's little things like that. If you went through ranger school and you're a Marine, where do you, where do you have that tap? You've got it underneath. You're yep. like, like guys got those things in there. Right? It's like little codes that we've got. And if you see someone, if you're an army ranger, or you're a Navy SEAL and you see someone wearing the trident and it's some like liberal out there, what are you going to do? You're going to go up and get smacked that guy you know, upside down. What are you doing? You're going to tear that thing off. I saw it. There was somebody, it was some clothing company. That Stolen was Valor. So, yeah. I mean, well, this was, yeah. they had a ranger tab. I mean, they didn't know, you mm -hmm. know, and put some Somebody designer thought it'd be cool to put ranger tab there. I mean, you don't put a ranger tab on. So it's like, and that was a big protest and that's a big deal. So you can't tell me that veterans do not care about image and uniforms and presentation. And my message is to get guys to understand that and that everything you wear is actually sending a message and an image. So you know, and just make sure that you don't betray expectations. Because when you would do an inspection and you see, you know, a guy and one of them, he's just good to go. I mean, everything about his uniform is, is spot on. And back, you know, when we used to shine our boots, I mean, it was something you look from the boots to if you use like parade, you know, use that, what is that, 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 that stuff, uh, edge liner. On the yeah, the edge the liner. Yep. yep. I remember that. I mean, it was all those details. When you see someone does that, I mean, you can see yourself in their boots and you see nothing is I mean, the uniform is immaculate. You don't even have to bother checking the inside of their M16 for rust. You don't have to. Like this guy, if he's done this, like it's good to go. However, when you get that turd that is like every, it's like, man, come on. You slept, did you sleep in this uniform? It doesn't even fit you properly. You, yeah. you can bet that they're going to go in and inspect everything. Because if he messed this up, he most likely did not clean out his wall locker, did not check out. And it's little things, it's why we did inspections, to be able to make sure, like, to be able to catch this. So understand that when people look at you, they're inspecting you. They don't know that they're doing this, but if they see something off, subliminally in their mind, they're thinking, can I trust this person with my business? Can I trust this young man to take care, you know, to go out with my daughter? Can I, you know, it's like all of these things, they're making that assessment. And so when I can help guys understand, you don't need to wear a suit to look good, but you do need to ensure that you're sending the message you want to send and do not betray expectations. Because when you do that, I don't trust you. I'm not going to give you my business. I'm not going to give you my daughter's hand in marriage. I'm not, I mean, it's like all these things are, are immediately uh, red flags, th those sirens. And when a guy understands that, I've accomplished my job. That's, that, that's awesome. And, and 
I noticed from your YouTube channel, you, you do give significant amounts of life advice in addition to just the, 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 the direct style stuff. Um, you know, I was, uh, was kind of laughing about your video about Bitcoin versus uh, getting a new suit. I thought that was kind of like a joke video uh, that you did. But, but some of the other ones you did where, you know, you talked about um, uh, getting your MBA from Harvard and how you didn't directly go to Harvard, but you got a chapter in a book for, for the Harvard University Press. And, you know, that gave a lot of great lessons on persistence, on understanding multiple different paths in your life. And, and I feel like every time I do watch one of your commentary videos, I'm getting a really valuable life lesson in addition to learning that, that skill of style that you talk about. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, and we expanded. I mean, initially when I started my channel, it was focused on one thing, custom clothing advice. So if you were looking to have anything done with a custom suit or custom shirts or trousers, that was my focus. And then I branched out into shoes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a natural progression. But then I branched out into more casual style. And then I branched out into, you know, other accessories. And then I realized, hey, like style is just one aspect. What about grooming? I mean, it's very natural, yep. hey, except if you want to talk about style, you can talk about grooming. And then all of a sudden I realized, hey, you know, what about the soft skills? Because you can be a well-dressed man, but if you don't know how to eat and how to deal with everything, how it's properly set at the table, if you don't know how to speak to a person, if you don't know how to, you know, greet a person, how to, you know, all these things I realized, they're all, they're all close to each other. So that's kind of how we've built out the brand. And we've encompassed quite a bit more. Now, I do think that there's a lot of strength for staying very niche, very early in your business because it's mm -hmm. easier to dominate that way. It's very difficult to become the number one. I mean, what you know, it's difficult to become the number one stylist in the world. If that you know, for right. my example, but it was very easy to become the number one guy on YouTube talking about men's custom clothing um, because there wasn't any. So just by default, by showing up, I was the number one guy. And then I expanded out. We got bigger. And we, we, we have become, in many ways, a lifestyle brand, uh, focusing on men. Now I've got a conference, the Menfluential Conference. Yep. I have a media company called Menfluential Media. And those companies now are bigger. Well, the, con the, the media company is bigger than Real Men Real Style in terms of revenue. But I wouldn't have been able to create that if I hadn't started off very narrowly focused and staying here on, on my niche. That's something that I learned in the online space that works really well. And, you know, so anyone going out there and starting a business, you know, that may be a great way to start. Yeah. It's like building a moat to protect yourself from the beginning, because if you go out and, you know, you're selling t-shirts, for example, uh, you know, you can buy a t-shirt from anywhere, Walmart, you, you can buy a t-shirt from, from any store. There's thousands of stores that sell them. But if your t-shirt fills a specific niche, maybe people like cats, then you start to protect yourself from the Walmarts and the thousands of other stores out there who are trying to market their t-shirts as well. So that's definitely a value, valuable lesson there. Um, one of the things, you know, as far as veterans go, a lot of us aren't used to, you know, dressing up in a suit, uh, a, a civilian suit all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, I've kind of had these style hiatuses, you know, th th there was a time where, um, you know, I, I got out and I went to the store and I decided I was going to buy myself a bunch of clothes, got myself a bunch of clothes, but then, you know, I went through some hard times and wasn't really making a lot of money, didn't buy clothes for a while. And then a few years later, I go into the store to buy some clothes for the first time and it looks like stuff from out of space, like these skinny jeans that I see now these days, a lot of the, the, the joggers that I see guys running around in, like I can't, just can't bring myself to do that. Um, number one, where should somebody like me, and, and I'll be fully upfront with this, I have, you know, I've, I probably own two pairs of jeans, one suit, uh, a few t-shirts. Where should somebody like me start? I would go to Barnes & Noble and mm -hmm. just go into the magazine section maybe get you know a few magazines that you like and they don't have to be style magazines and just go through start and, and identify people that you like that look mm -hmm. and mirror 
and start to identify like, you know, I like the way Justin Timberlake looks in this one. You know, oh man, I, I love the way that Daniel Craig, you know, is wearing this. Or, you know, maybe, you know, Idris Elba or, you know, some of these other actors out there, Chadwick Boseman, uh, you know, in, in the new Black Panther, man, I'm excited about that. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm just a huge Marvel fan. But, you know, it's like, so look at some of these guys and say, you know, that's, I, I like that. Maybe going to, you know, look at, you know, it, it's, and once you have a direction, then it's a matter of like working backwards and identifying, okay, why does he look good there? You know, it's like, okay, let's look at this. Where can I get this piece? Where can I get that piece? You can do a lot of shopping online. I would say that a lot of shopping out in the stores is you're at the mercy of what's in the store. And oftentimes, so you may go into a store and there's like, you know, a section of menswear, but how much is actually going to fit you? So that's the first thing is probably 90, 90%, 95% of the clothing you see here won't even fit you. Um, Another thing, so you, what you want to have is your own skin measurements and you can quickly, you know, just type in online how to take your skin measurements pretty easy because once you have that, what you can do is take a tape measure in or ask for one when you walk into a shop, but many of them won't have it. And you can lay out the clothing and you can say, okay, my shoulders are 19 inches across. Well, I want to make sure I get a shirt that's approximately 19 or 19.5 inches across. That way you don't rely just on the sizing as well. And style and looking good in general is really really very simple. Uh, it's don't try to overthink this. Um, daily day in and out, I'm wearing usually a Navy button down shirt, similar to what I have. I've got probably t like 20 different Navy button down shirts. I find this is my uniform. And I would think that first, what you want to do is just develop a uniform that you wear most of the time. I know again, for me, Navy button down shirt, long sleeve, which I can roll up when it's warmer. I wear a wide range of undershirts. Um, and then I, I wear dark colored jeans that are of a regular fit. And then I've got a wide range of boots and shoes that I interact with, that I change out with. But that's pretty much it. And I can always throw a sport. I love this look because I can wear it, throw a sports jacket over it and it's going to work with everything I've got. But right there, you get your one go-to outfit. Then maybe you branch away. You maybe find a few other shirts that you could bring in. And again, I got 20 different Navy shirts, but they're all different. Some of them have pockets. Some of them have different weaves. Some of them have like a little bit small patterns. Some of them are lighter blue. Some of them are dark blue. Some of them are, like I said, Navy. Um, it, I start to, I mean, notice I haven't gone too far from that one main outfit. Right. And what's cool is everything is interchangeable and there's nothing wrong with actually developing a uniform. I loved you know, when I was active duty, I mean, one thing I loved is, gosh, just being able to throw on my camis and go to work. Uh, I didn't have to think too much about it. It was everything worked too. I could, whatever set of camis I went with, it pretty much matched the boots. It pretty much matched the cover that I was going to wear. They all worked together. Uh, you know, when I was in, the, you know, with the wing, it was easy. Flight suit. I mean, you, you could show up and be a hard, hard night of drinking and you simply throw on your flight suit. You've got an undershirt on underneath and, you know, it's like, boom, you're just going in. I remember just wearing that stuff on my motor cycle and it was you know so you want your wardrobe to be initially that simple and you may be a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy i'm not saying that that's wrong uh, i am saying not thinking about it and actually identifying what really looks good on you mm -hmm. is is in my opinion a mistake because for me i'm a thin guy and you know i find that this shirt and this overall type of look actually just makes me look better and I like a collared shirt. It's a, it's a little bit dressier than not wearing that collared shirt. Um, now, you may find that a Henley just works out really well for your style. Or you may find that, hey, I am a casual suit guy. I live in Los Angeles. I'm wanting, aspiring to be an actor. So why not actually have a little bit of fun? I, and I think costume design and looking at, again, finding a great actor. Maybe you, you see you know, Ryan Gosling in some of these movies. You're like, man, I love his look. Uh, so, so go with that and be inspired. Awesome. Yeah, that's definitely some great advice. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's low cost advice too, because you just go out there, you grab a magazine, you identify the people that, you know, you want to look like, and then you start to pr try to put together those pieces. Um, I want to switch over to some of your personal influences. And, and uh, this is important to me because I always like to hear what types of things people are educating themselves with. So what, what's a particular book that you've read that's had the most influence on you? Gosh, uh, you know, a lot of these are going to be business books. So right now I'm listening to a book called, or I just went through Scaling Up. And I really, so for business, if anyone's into that, it's by a guy named uh, Vern Harnish, uh, but just a great one. 
Uh, I like the book Essentialism by, I think it was Greg McNound or something like that. Very, a very simple book about uh, just basically eliminating most things in life are noise. You know, social media has done wonders, but it also has done a lot of damage because people cannot seem to get out of their phones. And for you to identify what's important to you and what do you really need to accomplish, to, to get to your goals, it's really pretty simple at times, but we don't want to face it. And, um, and the final book I would recommend is Cal Newport's Deep Work. That one, again, revolutionary, amazing, but it's all about, you know, the world does not reward us for checking our email or for being really good at answering comments on Facebook or to fighting with someone in the, in the comments of YouTube. You, the world will not write, you know, well, not, you will not have success if that's what you're doing. You need to actually make a contribution. And mm -hmm. to do deep work, you've got to tune most things out and you've got to go deep. And this is very rare in today's information society when people are just distracted. I mean, if you could work through a solid six hours, eight hours a day without distraction and without being interrupted with phone calls, I mean, that's a superpower right there. And yep. Too few people actually have that. Yeah, that, that, that's an amazing superpower. Definitely, you know, one of the things I've learned is to keep my phone on airplane mode during the day, try and eliminate those distractions as much as possible. And, and you mentioned social media, but also the news. I think so many people are so addicted to getting on CNN to try to find the next thing that's going to piss them off and, 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 and get them into that, that negative state. So the best thing, that, when I deployed in 2002, uh, I gave away everything. Uh, I didn't want to get a storage unit, so I gave away even my, my bed, my television, everything. But I, I've never bought television after that. And oh, wow. I am so thankful that I, I mean, that is probably the best thing at my home. There's no television. There's no, va I call it the vampire, because it sits in your home and it sucks away your life. Because you're walking by it, it's it just, it's like we, we turn it on, it's like a fire to keep us warm. I don't know, and I go visit, you know, my brother, I, I love him, but I was visiting him in, in California. I remember we were, and we had, you know, drive, driven across the country to see our family, to hang out, and we all sit around the TV. And it's like, I mean, that this, and I've learned this from living abroad. My wife's family, they don't, you know, it's always about when you sit and you spend time with people, you sit and you spend time with people. And so that was just something I, it, she just finds it very odd. And, and I do too of a place where if you're gathering place in your home, why do you have a television right there? You know, you, you know, try to make it a little bit more difficult. And, and I mean, we're not weirdos because we do enjoy a good movie. We love going to the movies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I have a projector at my house, so I will set it up sometimes and project the movie uh, for my kids and we'll set up the sound. But it takes like 20 minutes to set that up. And that little barrier is a huge deal because, yeah, don't waste your life watch it, watching that television, watching the news. I don't, I don't get any news. If it's big news, my mom will call me. My neighbors will let me know. But I found that like, not, what, not, not checking the news, not getting the news forced on me, huge. I, I feel so much better. Yeah. It'll find you if it's that important. Um, what are some of your personal habits and, and what's your daily routine look like? Like what, what types of things have you incorporated, incorporated in your life to stay sharp? Sure. I, I wouldn't say I've got a daily routine. I have more like a weekly routine if that in general, but I would say I have a habit of telling people I love them. And for my kids, to my wife, my 13-year-old son, he knows that his dad loves him. Now, he doesn't tell me this very often. He loves me, unfortunately. I, I, I'm always living for it. But, I mean, I grab him and wrestle him, and I'm kissing him on the head, telling him I love him multiple times. My wife, I always tell her that I love her, that I'm thankful for her, that she's doing a great job. Because because many times I do forget, and many times I do take things for granted. And many times I do, you know, I'm like any other guy out there. But my family will always know, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, uh, a lot of my friends, I've told them I love them. You know why? Because we're, we're, all, we're all dead men at the end of the day. It's coming for us. Mm -hmm. And the regret that people have and that you hear is that they didn't let people that they know who, who mean a lot to them, let them know that they love them. And I, I've lost that whole pride. It's not, you know, I'm, it's just something that I, I guess – you know, seeing enough, you know, death. It's just one of those things that no one that I care about will not know that, that I care about them. And so I try to be a very positive person with my team, a habit I have with my team. Because uh, 
I, I usually schedule meetings with them and I schedule other things to happen and that's how I kind of fall into it. I just show up. But I'm always trying to be the positive force with my team because they're going to have enough things in, and I do let them know when things aren't to the level they need to be at, very high expectations. But my habits, again, are consistently, I try to be a positive person. I'm tr- I'm, whenever I'm driving somewhere, I always set it up so I'm, I've got a few people I've got on speed dial who I haven't talked to for a while, and I'm just checking in how is their life. So those are, to me, the most important habits, the ones that I'm outwardly, outwardly projecting positive positive thoughts, positive energy, and putting this stuff out there. And it, what's cool is it comes right back. And that's what keeps me really motivated. Now, when it comes to like this other schedule, like, you know, other things in life, I would like to say I wake up at 5 a.m., go straight to the gym and, you know, have a monster workout and have a monster workout. That doesn't always happen. I have to admit that uh, I've really, like, I'm sleeping in a bit more and I actually kind of enjoy it. My kids are homeschooled and we just, we just but we do try to have at least two meals a day at the house with my family. And uh, so tonight we'll have a nice dinner. Uh, we had a good breakfast. I would say uh, I've got an office. And it's 800 meters from my house. I don't have to do this, but I do it because all my work stays here. So I have another habit that work doesn't follow me home. In fact, I can't log in. I couldn't do this interview from my house. I don't have a computer at my house that would allow me to do this. I don't have anything on my phone, like social media, that's going to interrupt my day with my kids. Like, I do have like a work phone and, and the stuff is here. But those are probably my, my habits are the systems I've created that allow me to, again, try, and I try to be really effective. They, every computer I try to keep at least two screens. Um, another thing is I don't spend time in email. I've got two assistants. And again, I run a company and it's internet focused. So we get a lot of messages, about yep. 300 unique messages a day from on YouTube, from emails, at least 150 emails, uh, you know, Facebook comments, LinkedIn messages. I got guys that I served with and I, you know, I got a, 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 you know, was a track guy the other day. It was like, you know, Tonio, haven't heard from you forever, man. What's going on? And so what I've got, my systems go through and they weed through 95% of those messages. Mm-hmm. And the, every day I come into my inbox and what does it have? I've got one big message of Antonio. These were the, These were the messages I couldn't answer for you. So my assistants, and again, I've got two of them that do this. They just monitor and clean out my email full time. And the vast majority of messages, I've given them a set of rules. They can handle that that type of work. But the the nine to 10 messages I see a day are the really, are the ones that, you know, maybe it's a vet. A lot of times, like vets always come to me. Anyone that's served always gets priority. And it's like, hey, this guy has this question, or he's curious about this, or this, or you've got a, you know, this message from someone you haven't heard from for a long time. And then I'll just simply record an audio recording, uh, usually using Jig. It's a, it's a screencast, and it limits itself to five minutes. And I, I just quickly answer all those questions in five minutes, and then boom, I'm done with email. Wow. So what that does is it frees me up mm-hmm. to focus in on what's important. And what's important in my business is making video, is coming up with topics for video, having meetings with VIPs, usually it's going to be my business partners, and then directing my team and my company in the direction it needs to go. And then if I do that, the day's a win. And uh, yeah, that's so those awesome. that's kind of, yeah, the Good. power of systemization, the power of just just building systems into your life, just to to be able to focus on what's important and get rid of all that that extra stuff. That's that's definitely solid advice there. Um, we got a, just a couple of minutes left. I want to ask you quickly: What are you? Where is Real Men Real Style heading over the next year and and over the next five years? What what do you got your 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 videos? You have your courses. You have the Menfluential Conference. Um, where, where are you guys going? Yeah, I would say, you know, my goal maybe in the next five years, and I, and I'm given my, I'm looking also 25 years ahead is to really is to be the number one resource in the world, uh, for men's information and style. You know, it's like, so I look at where Esquire was, I look at companies like GQ and I really feel they've missed the boat in many ways. They've, they've lost touch. I mean, you can't, they just really, they're, they're cool magazines at times. But other times, like they put in like five thousand dollars suits, which are cool. But most of us can't. I mean, that that's just outside of most people's budget. Yeah. They don't even understand why would I spend five thousand on this suit? And does GQ, you know, or or Esquire have my interest in mind? So my goal is to dominate and become the number one channel across all platforms, 
cumulatively uh, for the men's style space. So we do well on YouTube. We're about, you know, we're number two, I would say, over there. Uh, you know, my friend Aaron Marino is number one, so it's a healthy competition. And we're partners on other things. Mm-hmm. So what you could say, I like, it, it, but what I get excited about is, you know, the infographics we put out, the, the where we're growing on our website and how we continue to get larger there. Uh, all the articles we continue to put out. Instagram, we're building up there. Pinterest, we have a podcast. I mean, there are just so many different platforms that I'm, I'm growing on. And uh, I get excited just thinking that this business is going to continue to grow. Now, it's not always going to be with me. And in fact, one big change people are going to see with the company is I'm going to kind of move my, like any good systemization person, I realize I am the bottleneck in many parts of my business. So I do see over the next five years, myself becoming less of the face of the company and me being able to bring in more people uh, that can, I think, better represent my audience and better serve them. Awesome. Yeah, definitely lessons on scaling there. And I see why you're, why you're reading the scaling book um, on, on, on building that growth and, and uh, you know, definitely things that a lot of people out there who are running their own businesses can, can learn from. Uh, Tony, do you have any last words for the audience? I think this has been a fantastic conversation. And again, I want to thank you for coming on. Do you have any last, last uh, bits of advice or, or things you want to get out to the audience before we go? You know, you know, I just know we've got a veteran audience. And so what I would stress to them is don't be afraid uh, if you're holding back on, you know, it's one thing you get out and you figure out pretty quickly is that, you know, if you got out as a light bird or you got out as an E3, who you were in the military doesn't define you as who you are you know, when, you, when you get out. You, you do lose your rank. Uh, you do, you know, but at the same time, you never lose your experience and everything you learn. And I do think that a lot of guys getting out, it is an amazing opportunity for them to recreate themselves and to rebuild who they are. So don't be afraid to, and I think one of the things that they don't see all the time is see another veteran who's ahead of you in an industry you want to be in and reach out to that guy or that gal and, and talk to them. And, and you know, cause they're going to make time for you. I can tell you that I know, you know, guys like John Dubas have made time for veterans. I make time for veterans and it's something that veterans want to see other vets succeed. And so don't be afraid to reach out to them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Antonio, again, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I want to wish you a happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you and your family and to everyone out there, everyone out there. There's been so many lessons that Antonio's given us today and, and, you know, really take these to heart. You know, we talked about some of the lessons he gave at the beginning as far as finding mentors, you know, running your own business, finding your purpose in this life, focusing on what's important. And, and think about how many times a day you worry about things that aren't going to contribute to your success or aren't going to contribute to your personal growth. Um, and if you want to check out Antonio, we're going to have all of his links up on our show notes. If you want to check out the YouTube channel, check out his website, check out some of his amazing courses. And uh, to each and everybody out there, make sure you get out there, apply this knowledge, and live your best life. <laughs>